Well, good morning or good evening to you all and uh, good afternoon here from Dubai, where I'm situated here with our guest today. And welcome to this, our fifth webinar in the SIPS MENA series. My name is Sam Champong. I'm the head of SIPS Middle East and North Africa, and I'm pleased to welcome you all once again from wherever you are across the world. Today, we're going to focus on recruitment. The economic toll of the COVID-19 pandemic has led to an unprecedented level of job losses around the world. Almost no industry has been spared and no country or region has escaped the effects of the global pandemic. So in this situation, where the job market is saturated with people looking to be hired or rehired, in a situation where several countries now have record levels of unemployment, how do you manage to secure a job? For the few, if any, opportunities there are there out there, how do you stand out amongst the crowd and become successful in finding your next role? You'll all have an opportunity to hear from our guests today, and we'll also have time for you to pose your own questions. Uh, and if you do have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A button below to type your questions or simply click the raised hat, raise hand button and I'll come over to you in case you choose to ask your questions live. Today, we have just the right person to give us the tools we need to be successful in today's job market, as well as provide a summary on just what exactly is happening out there as far as recruitment is concerned. Dominic Falzerano is the Regional Director for Michael Page Middle East, which is part of the global recruitment firm, The Page Group. Originally from the UK, Dominic has been with Michael Page since 2006, and he moved to the Middle East in 2008. During that time, he's established many of the technical practices for the group here in the region. Uh, he's certainly one of the most well-known recruiters in the region, and we're very grateful to have him with us uh, today. Uh, Dominic, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you. And uh, before we start, Dominic, let me ask you, what, what brought you here to the MENA, MENA region, and specifically, uh, what brought you from living in London to coming out here to Dubai? Yeah, sure. So I uh, I came out in 2008. We had we started the office at the back end of uh, 2006, and uh, obviously there was huge growth potential out in the uh, out here in the Middle East in the region. Uh, and I saw a great opportunity to uh, really further my career uh, and expedite the process to uh, to uh, to, uh, to develop the next steps. So uh, I put my hand up in in 07. For, for an international move, I came out in April. Came to meet uh, meet, meet the time, meet the guys, meet the team, and uh, moved out here in November, two thousand and eight, and haven't looked back since. So I've been out here yet now, nearing nearing twenty years in this year. It's gone gone very quickly. <laughs> Fantastic! It certainly sounds like. Uh, it's but look, I'll move. Um, so look, I'll move. Yes, very much so. Very much so. But look, I'll move into uh, I'll move into the uh, into the into the presentation. Um, so yeah, during this presentation, I'll talk about um, our, you know, what, what the current uh, status is in terms of the uh, specific sectors, in terms of recruitment, and then talk about um, in terms of uh, finding, uh, how, you know, best tools in terms of finding a, a new opportunity. Um, so look, to give you first of all uh, an idea in terms of the uh, what what is happening out there in specific sectors, what what we are seeing. Um, I'll start off with uh, you know, banking, financial services, insurance. Look, within within banks, uh, we're not seeing the uh, you know, the, the many uh, the many widespread uh, layoffs. Um, you know, we still see there's still there's still a demand there for for uh, for people. Certainly, when we look at the sort of tech, digital, and data roles, governance, risk, and compliance, there's there's still a demand, um, which you know, which is which is a good sign. Um, if I move over to, uh, to, to, to financial services, again, you know, we're still you know, not, not the huge layoffs. We're still seeing the demand for investment officers and associates, most, mostly more at the, uh, probably more at the more junior, junior end, uh, with uh, more you know, candidates with more analysis and uh, deeper digital skills. Um, within insurance, we're seeing within the audit and advisory space uh, still, you know, still, still quite a, quite a, seen quite a large, large demand. Um, energy sector, uh, natural gas consumption uh, has gone up, probably because there's obviously a lot more of us at home cooking, uh, so there's a bit more uh, demand for uh, for natural gas. So we've seen that sector 
um, certainly still recruit. So, you know, certainly we'll be looking at the corporate support, support roles in the energy sector um, and uh, with, within compliance and risk, uh, HSC, uh, and process improvement excellence. We're still seeing the demand. Um, transportation, which is uh, obviously one that's sort of big to a lot of us here. Um, you know, 3PL still, still, uh, still busy uh, as they have a very via, uh, varied, uh, varied client base. Um, distribution business in, you know, in the FMCG has been particular, particularly busy. And I'm not sure you've heard of stories of uh, the Dubai taxi drivers working with Car4 to, uh, to deliver shopping. So uh, yeah, there's a big there's there's, there's a big uh, there's a big demand in that space. Um, you, know, you know, shipping and logistics uh, businesses based locally have been hiring quite aggressively. If I move on to the government and public sector, um, yeah, this is a big sector here here in the region. Employer uh, for for many people. Um, Within, within, certainly within Saudi Arabia, um, so that's it. Uh, we find these clients are uh, you know, are going through um, you know, viewing cats all uh, on online. So whether it's Zoom, Teams, Skype, etc., and onboarding candidates remotely. So you know, onboarding candidates from 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 their home from their home country. Um, so we're still seeing you know, the government sector, especially in KSA, especially related to the 2030 vision, um, that are still you know, quite heavily uh, heavily recruiting. Um, so I move on to um, I move on to technology. Uh, the tech companies, uh, certainly the service providers and the system integrators with products that are related to cloud software, enhanced security, and visualization, uh, virtualization. Sorry. Have been, have been busy. Um, the new pay, payment platforms, online transaction, cashless payment is you know, it's been quite essential. Big demand there. Companies looking for, you know, looking ready for, you know, when some form of normality to come uh, return. Telecoms strategy and innovation, trying to capitalise on the current current situation. Um, FMCG. We've seen locally based manufacturing and uh, production units still fully functional. So they're still still uh, still manufacturing, still producing, still you know, still recruiting, and we're still you know still hiring for, for a lot of companies here. Um, you know, distribution as we spoke about, you know, for FMCG products. And, you know, we spoke about that within the transportation space. You know, I'm sure many of you have seen that um, Deliveroo as well now delivering groceries. So there's a uh, you know big, big push in that space. Um, you know, um, within within facilities management, uh, you know, we've seen um, we've seen some obvious new, you know, obviously reasons we've seen some new roles and high demand for people to work, to operate across all the asset classes within the new sanitate, sanitation guidelines and no touch movement. Um, so especially when it look, when we look at cleaning, we look at waste management, we've seen we've seen the demands. Um, and finally, manufacturing. This obviously relates to the FMCG part that we spoke about earlier. So consumer goods, chemical, medical devices, still, uh, you know, still recruiting. Uh, the pharma, medical, de you know, medical device business is still, uh, still, still quite, quite active. I then move on to uh, specific, uh, specific skill sets. Um, look, obviously, you know, the, the key ones for us today, procurement. Um, procurement, you know, we what we find in times of uh, in times of crisis procurement's when it really you know, come, you know there's a big demand you know, to help us look at look at that bottom line um, so look at the you know look at that cost line and how do we how we how do we you know how do we reduce that so we still see uh, we, we see a demand for specifically when we look at strategic sourcing candidates looking at uh, looking at category managers um, there's still there's still a demand in, in particular with uh, Looking at the uh, the indirect uh, direct indirect space, there's uh, there's a request for for candidates. Um, supply chain, as we you know, spoke about within you know, the technology FMCG manufacturing, there remains active. So traditional roles um, remain fairly active. So there's still a high demand for operational excellence, lean six sigma, process improvement. You know, all the roles that are looking at cost optimization and process excellence. 
um, are, are, are in demand. I move more to the other ones, which, um, so for example, the governance risk and compliance, um, there's still a big demand for, uh, you know, for candidates in this space, uh, especially at this time, that you know, they, they tend to look for candidates with, that are more of a big four caliber background, um, that are always going to be, you know, always going to look for in this, uh, in this, in this region. Uh, especially they look for specific, you know, certificates and professional training and audit and compliance, uh, which are quite heavily uh, demanded. Strategy investments, uh, M and A. Um, you know, um, it, you know, there's more detailed analysis that is required. Data is less available and needs to be interpreted differently. So companies are uh, are looking for uh, looking for for these profiles. Um, especially as you know, deeper due diligence is, is required uh, as commercial strategies are changing quite quite rapidly. Um, so uh, stronger, you know, stronger technical skills are needed more now, you know, more now than ever. Uh, and certainly the leadership skills are being are being tested with uh, with the investments in MA and strategy, etc. Uh, data analysis, you know, data management enhanced, uh, you know, Analytical skills are in demand. Businesses are looking to make you know, data-driven uh, decisions uh, for now and for when the make and for when the market recovers. So, where we're seeing demand after candidates that have any experience within retail, uh, consumer segmentation, and payment platforms. Um, you know, um, you know, the what I'm hearing, hearing back from the team is that look, it's candidates that they don't have this experience, spend some time learning. And developing new technical skill sets, as this is, we see this going to be a big, uh, being a big area. Uh, marketing comms, um, digital, uh, so knowledge of digital marketing principles uh, has been growing demand over the last couple of years, and it, uh, and now we're seeing, you know, there's there's bigger demand than ever. So you know, we're looking for you know uh, candidates, to, you know, our clients look for candidates to be more creative. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's. We're seeing that there's lots of online uh, courses on digital marketing, interesting case studies available to view uh, for candidates to, to develop in, in this space. Within tech, uh, where we're seeing the demands are information and cybersecurity. Um, as we, you know, a lot of us are now working, you know, the majority of us are now working from home. Um, so you know, enhanced mobility and access means there's greater need for, uh, for security. So we're seeing tech consulting companies and end user organizations are hiring talent. Uh, and we see this demand continuing to increase over the coming months. Uh, digitalization, yeah, every business is either patting themselves on the back or sweating over how they can get up to speed in, in this current, current, uh, current climate. So um, digital strategy and transformation professionals are, and consulting firms have been, have been looked at for advice and guidance. Um, and virtualization, mobility, and cloud professionals being targeted by end users and tech companies alike. Um, some tech, tech companies are, are even looking to hire people with these skills to work remotely from overseas, as I was talking about earlier with the uh, government sector. Um, legal, um, you know, recent conversations have shown a clear preference for lawyers with the experience of e commerce, data protection, digital experience. Um, you know, so we expect to see these skills. Will be the most desirable over over the year within uh, in 2020 um, and uh, HR um, employment engagement strategies creating performance development programs as we're all working from home how do we measure um, you know, people's uh, performance um, and looking at transformation and policies in light of the uh, current situation um, and finally in, in, within the industrial space as we talked about earlier, uh, facilities management and HSC, where we've seen a bit of a spike. So that gives you an overview of the in-demand sectors and skills in the region at the moment. So I move to the next slide, and I now move on to uh, discuss more in terms of right, how to find uh, how to find an opportunity um, in the uh, in in the, in, the current, uh, in the current climate. I'll start off by you know, in terms of writing writing your CV. Um, and then I'll move on to discuss uh, other other you know, other other techniques to help with uh, your recruitment. Um, you know, in terms of writing the CV, you know, your CV ideally shouldn't be any more. You know, ideally, two pages, no more than three. Um, you know, aim to ensure the content is clear, structured, concise, and relevant. 
Um, you know, I always find it's better, you know, looking at your more recent job, you know, having more information, the further you go back uh, with, uh, within your CV, the less information you, you put in. I, I recommend that sort of underneath each opportunity, uh, you know, obviously you give the organization, you give the data you've worked there, and you give your title. You may give a brief uh, one line about the company, who they are, what they do, uh, and then talk about your uh, your key key responsibilities, uh, and then a couple of bullet points about your key achievements within uh, within within the role. Um, you know, it's important to tell your CV to each job uh, because each each job is going to be slightly different, uh, and there's probably different parts of your skill sets that you need to highlight for uh, for for the opportunity. Um, take the time once once the CV's done to uh, check uh, for any grammatical uh, errors and spelling mistakes. You'll be surprised uh, how many uh, you know, how many will appear uh, and ask an independent third party to review the whole document uh, for you uh, before you're sending it out. You know, in, in light of the current market where you know you are you know where you will be competing amongst the uh, uh, amongst some of the other, other candidates. It's important that yeah, you don't let little mistakes like this um, put your profile further down, down the list. Um, you know, um, remember when when writing instructions, see that it's essentially it's marketing yourself. This is how you're you're selling yourself to uh, you know, to employers. So use the details provided to form interview. Yeah, and they'll use this to form interview questions. So be clear, uh, concise, easy to read. You, know, you don't want to give them uh, give employers sort of uh, you know, big questions to really sort of leave yourself quite open. Um, gaps in career history, you know, explain those. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, don't let any, you, know, you don't want to put falsehoods on an, or inaccuracies because that could open you up um, and uh, and cost you an opportunity. So put everything in there. Just be 100% uh, honest with what you put in the CV because uh, the employer will appreciate that. Uh, there's no need to, no reason to include your reasons for leaving your jobs, but be prepared to answer those questions. When asking those questions, again, give a clear, concise answer. Um, this doesn't need to be a three, four minute overview. You know, um, they'll, be, you know, they'll be looking at to understand why you've, you've left. Um, so just be very clear and concise with that. Um, don't include your current salary in your CV. Uh, and a good covering letter should always accompany your your profile. I always find it's, it's well having a synopsis, you know, sort of a one, one two paragraph synopsis at the top of your CV as to why you feel you are suitable uh, for the uh, for the opportunity. So moving on, developing a virtual network. So. In the modern era, it's never been easier to connect with with each other uh, than it is than it is uh, right now. There, yeah, there are so many platforms that gives us access to to friends, family, colleagues, or customers. But how are we how are we using them to our advantage? LinkedIn is regarded as the best tool to use for expanding your personal virtual network. Whilst LinkedIn is smaller than uh, some other social networks, it's still pretty big. It has more than three hundred million users. It's still growing. So. The goal, the goal with LinkedIn, uh, almost always be, you know, should always be you know, to generate leads, subsequent sales, and in this instance, is to sell yourself. Before we start, let's remind ourselves that you know your virtual network is your personal brand. Make sure you have a professional photo, a, pre a completed online LinkedIn profile with highlights of who you are, what you do and where you're currently working, uh, and ensure any personal social media profiles are kept private if you wish to have, if you wish to have a more informal online presence. This, you know, this segment will focus on the, on the strategies that will help you build the most effective network possible, both in size and quality, with quality being the most important factor. So the first one is determine who, with who you're trying to connect. Really focus on who you want to connect with and why while staying fairly open-minded to who, who, you, who will accept and return. If someone is asked to connect with you, it might be because you feel that uh, you could be of use to them, and in turn, they could be of use to you. The, the more connections you have, the more visible you would be to other people's connections, and a strong virtual network will, help you, will, will, will have you soaring in the most viewed profiles, which means you're more visible to hiring managers and recruiters alike. 
So when adding to your network, you should think of the following themes. Add everyone you already know. So this could be family, friends, colleagues, ex-colleagues, university peers, etc. This will create your base camp and it's an easy way to grow the number of connections you have. Two, ensure your people to connect, you know, encourage people to connect with you. You can, you can add your LinkedIn account to your email signatures to make it clear in your LinkedIn profile you're happy for people to connect with you. Of course, remembering to accept their connection. Okay. Uh, three, go out and connect with people directly. This, is really, this really is the most important aspect. Target peers within your industry um, and target senior profiles to yourself, one, two, or three layers above. Uh, also, you know, connecting with HR recruit professionals is, of course, advised. Follow companies of interest within your expertise or sector, keeping up to date with industry news and highlighting who is a key opinion uh, leader within this field, and then, you guessed it, connect with them. Groups. Groups are heavily overlooked, and there's an easy way to find like-minded people um, who could be of use to you in the future. Search for groups within your geographical sector, so within your ge geographical area, within your sector or job function, and join them. There are plenty of connections to be found here and all share a common interest, uh, which improves the quality of your connection. <coughs> Moving on to the next one. So become someone uh, people want to connect with. Having people invite themselves into your network is, is, the easier, is the easiest and most effective way to ensure you're developing your virtual network. I would dedicate at least one hour a day to LinkedIn, accepting connections, sending Sorry, accepting connections, sending connections, and reading information being shared by people, companies, and groups you are following. Don't be passive. You need to share content yourself. This can be as simple as sharing an article you read that day or passing uh, information on. You could go one step further and write, write, and write an article. A quick fire one page of your insights or thoughts into the current professional situation uh, is a great way to uh, enhance, enhance your profile. Engage with the content you are see, seeing. Ask questions to your network, to your network, and, ask, and answer pe and answer other people's questions. Again, this will increase your visibility and will make people want to follow or connect with you. Okay. But a warning note here: LinkedIn is not Facebook, so try to avoid politics or things that, that are borderline informal. Third, avoiding yeah, how to avoid common networking mistakes. How many times have you been to a conference, dished out as many business cards as you can, collect them to, but done nothing with them? I know I have. It's the most common networking trap we all fall into, and your virtual network is no different. There is a common misconception when it comes to networking, and in, and in, in, in that, it has one step, meet new people. In fact, there are two steps, and the second one will be the difference between you being noticed or forgotten. And that, is, uh, and that is to meet new people and build a relationship with those people. You know, we all go to, uh, to, to networking events, we did, you know, we met lots of new people <coughs> to, the, to the card, but then did nothing with it. So, you know, it's important to follow, follow that up, build the relationship, build the network. So when someone's sending out a message, you will have a simple, a higher response rate if you include a brief message to them. So rather than just connecting with someone, um, you know, actually put a little note, keep to connect as we work, work in the same field. Or I see we share mutual connections, let's connect too. You know, true to reading someone's articles or posts and, and, and connecting with them and saying, look, I, you know, I read your article, I, I appreciate that, it was quite good. Um, and that's a great way to, to increase the network. Once you're connected, you should be following up with that person. Don't let that virtual business card sit on your desk for five weeks and then disappear. If you have connected with them, there, there was a reason for that. So tell them, engage with them. If you have connected with them, ask them how they can help you. Being able to point people to your own content is an easy way of adding value to new connections and building that relationship. So if, you, if a connection has shared something of interest, let them know about it. Ask them if you can share it. It may be simple, but adding value to someone else's content will make you more, build, more visible, build relationships, and, uh, and uh, further strengthen that uh, uh, those, those so the key takeout from this section is think about who you want to connect with and why. Follow up with that connection to build a relationship, share content, be visible to other people, and join and create groups and drive network connections.
So the next slide talks about how you stand out to uh, you know, how you stand out to to to, to recruiters. Um, so you know, we now live in a world where the number of job seekers versus job roles will be higher uh, than than ever before. So you know, this is very much going to be a client uh, client driven market. So this so this now means that we're going to have to put in more effort for fewer results, and it means accepting that the efforts we put in today may take unusually long to translate into results. But finding your next job is not impossible. It is, excuse me, it just means you have to be more resilient. In this portion I talk about, uh, I discuss a few ways in which stand out to recruiters. Um, uh, and I agree that, uh, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you ask, people ask the question in terms of get, how do you get, you know, that getting the attention of recruiters can be difficult and quite frustrating. We as recruiters want to build relationships with as many people as possible. Uh, but the challenge we face is often managing the volumes that come through for, for a job. Um, far after not when we put an advert up, uh, the amount of uh, responses, it's literally impossible to go through for each and every one. So while you might be trying to build a relationship with, uh, with one recruiter, their work is also done between relationships with hundreds of candidates. Um, if you cannot get through to them that time doesn't mean you're not valuable or worthy of being represented. It just takes a couple of tries and see the applications for you to reach the top of the pile. I'll offer, I'll offer, you know, I, I, I can offer some of my personal observations here um, and how to build good relationships with with uh, uh, with recruiters um, and in how to develop long-term and productive uh, relationships. So first of all, I recommend set alerts on uh, the recruitment agency websites. Now, you probably already do this on LinkedIn, but it's also important that you do that on, uh, on the recruiters website. So whether it be my page, for example. Okay. But if you haven't gone onto the agency websites, then, then do it. This is so you can get emails every time a job in, in your field is advertised. Then you can review the requirement and reach out to the recruiter directly as soon as you post it. So be one of the first profiles to be in touch with, uh, with the recruiter. After you've uh, applied, call with the recruiter hiring manager. Yeah, appreciate this can be tricky right now, and generally the direct contact information of uh, especially HR professionals and line managers is often not accessible. But if the role is advertised by a recruiter and you think and you think you tick all the boxes, give the, give the recruiter a call and let them know that you made the application and you feel the application suitable for, for, you, for you, you feel the job suitable for your uh, uh, with your skill set. Yeah. You never know, the recruiter may review your CV while you're on the phone uh, and this increases your chances of getting shortlisted for the role. If the role was, post, if the role was posted by a recruiter you are, uh, you are in regular contact with then, uh, and you haven't been in touch with them uh, for a while, don't, don't feel discouraged. Give them a call yeah, or just drop them a WhatsApp, get in touch with them, reach out. Um, number three, I'd stand out to recruiters, failure your CV. Um, yeah. As I talked about earlier, in cases where your CV is not one size fits all, it's important to highlight that to the specific opportunity. Um, each job will be slightly different, uh, and there will be certain skills that you have that's important. You, you highlight that uh, for uh, for the opportunity. Um, so, as the roles you apply for, probably also not one size fits all. So, when looking at the job requirements, you want to showcase the most relevant uh, specialist skills at the top of your skill. At, at, of your CV and work your way down to more generalist work. So for instance, you're applying for a job where the main requirements is to have knowledge uh, of, uh, of specific uh, requirements. Um, you can also speak to the, speak to the recruiter. Now, hopefully you know, you've developed with a recruit, you develop a relationship with a recruiter over time um, and ask them, ask them look, what, what do you feel I should be highlighting? Um, on, uh, on on my CV, what part of my skill set um, that you feel that like should be yeah, it should be is the client looking for? What are the key 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 areas that they they, they want to know? Uh, but you know, note what I said. You know, uh, you know, um, you know, what I said earlier. Though, it's, you know, this this does take time, so it's uh, you know, it's it's it is a lengthy uh, a lengthy process. Uh, so uh, yeah, ensure that you do tailor 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 CV. Um, even if you're not moving on to number four, even if you're not right to you know, uh, even if you don't tick every single one of the boxes, um, but you tick let's say seventy eight percent of the box boxes, connect with the recruiter anyway. 
uh, you, should always, you, know, you should always have a link to a crew team, even if you are not looking for a job right now. It's always good to have a relationship for whether it's for now or for the, for the future. Uh, accept accept, uh, accept uh, LinkedIn recruitment, uh, accept uh, LinkedIn connection requests from recruiters, respond to their messages, take their calls. That's how you build, build the relationship. You might hear about some interesting and relevant market information, uh, gain, gain access to, to, uh, to insights uh, that they've shared, and you might be able to help fellow colleagues land, land, their, land their dream opportunity uh, or land, land opportunity. Uh, and, yeah, and, when, uh, and if and when your circumstances change, you'll change, you'll have an existing relationship to tap into that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, moving on to the next part, number five though, what's critical is don't work with too many, uh, too many recruiters. How many times have uh, you know, we seen that sort of you see a job advertised by you know, three or four diff different, different agencies? So you know, try and pick one, two, uh, max three uh, recruiters um, that, that, that you work with. But, you know, there, are a lot of, there are a lot out there, uh, some of them based locally, some of them based overseas. Um, so choose who, who you want to work with, you know, who, has, who is best for you know, your specific uh, industries. And many people think that spreading their, you know, spreading their base as far, uh, far and wide will guarantee they find a job, but it's not necessarily the case. And, um, you know, just because your CV lands uh, on an employer's desk via five different sources doesn't mean you're going to get the, uh, uh, doesn't mean you get the opportunity. If anything, the employer will be like, well, why is this person not in control of the CV and where, where it is currently, uh, where it's currently going. So, especially in markets where it is a small, small network, uh, it's important that uh, you, know, you, you manage that, uh, you know, manage that tightly. So, my advice is to say, limit your interactions. Ideally, one to maximum three reputable uh, recruiters who cover the local market well. One that you can build a strong relationship with, who you can call up, just even just to you know, seek advice. And you can trust to come to you with the, the right opportunities that they know that specifically uh, for yourself. Uh, never go directly to a company. Probably often here um, that the recruiters disclose to you as the hiring entity. While this can feel like a way of increasing your chances with the company, it may have the opposite effect. So when candidates go outside of the process, that in effect has been chosen by the company. It can not only eliminate your application, it makes your job, uh, it makes our job in promoting your application harder. So it's, it's obviously much easier for us to, uh, to speak with, uh, with the hiring manager um, to, uh, to process, but if you apply directly and you have to hear nothing back, then it's, it's very difficult um, to, uh, so there's a lot of background work goes on in presenting a CV to a client. We have received extensive training on how to deliver this. We work very hard to properly showcase the candidate's relevant skills, uh, and and we do this so you don't have to. I also uh, I also want to stress the importance of privileged information and remind you that if a recruiter has shared information related to a client they're recruiting for with you, they've shared this information in confidence. The same way you would share your information with them, expecting absolute discretion. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask the recruiter what information is confidential and what is not. Understand this will be this this will be critical so you don't lose faith within your recruiter and end up closing off a large portion of the job market. Be honest. Uh, you know, any information we ask for, uh, you know, it's only it's so we can better represent yourself. If you can't be honest with your recruiter about your current situation, your current salary inaccurate dates of employment, about the type of role you want to move into and what motivating factors, then we can't, we can't represent you correctly. Um, we can't invest in your best interest. You know, uh, even, for example, you know, uh, on the salary side, you know, it's important that you, uh, you, know, you, you, you highlight your, your, your current salary, what you're on right now, because employers will ask for that later on in the process. They'll ask for a salary slip. They want to know what you're currently, currently earning. Uh, so, uh, don't, you know, don't, don't overinflate inf any information because uh, it will just come back to, uh, or put inaccurate information because it will just come back to bite you uh, further, down, uh, further, down, further down the line. Um, and then lastly, is break the barrier between being a cat, between candidate and client relationships. 
Now, the benefit of working with someone you already know is that there is an existing partnership to build upon. So we are better likely to know what matches you, uh, what matches your personality. We know you uh, and we know your team better than anyone else. So it, this, this, this then translates to us knowing who the candidates are that are available to you in the market and can target the ones uh, and the companies you are uh, respectable. Um, this, this will help save, you know, this will help save the client's time and fill in the vacant position. So just because we might work with, uh, with you as a candidate, it doesn't mean we don't sit on the other side of the fence. And if you are working with a rep to a recruiter, you should be confident in their ability to operate ethically and on the basis of strict confidentiality. Um, suggesting a 360 degree partnership will elevate your, uh, your recall value and, and uh, ensure presence uh, in the recruiter's mind. So they will think of you first when a suitable opportunity uh, arises. So in the, in the current, um, this next next slide is uh, particularly important in the in the current uh, in the current in the current climate. Um, so video interview tips, um, preparation, um, test the technology, video platform and devices fully charged, um, and obviously you've got a strong uh, signal Wi-Fi connection. Um, obviously, so many times that uh, sort of people leave it to the last minute and then work out there's an issue um, and the interview starts. 10, 15 minutes late, and obviously that uh, um, um, yeah, reflects poorly on, uh, on, on, on the candidate. Um, still dress professionally for, for an interview. Yeah, even though we, we, you know, we are taking these interviews from home, ensure that you put a, a shirt on, uh, you, you've dressed in a professional, in a professional manner, and, and have the right uh, environment uh, around you. Um, um, I, I, we did have an instance recently where the candidate actually uh, went to an interview uh, wearing a basketball top. So it does, uh, I know it sounds basic, but people uh, do, uh, don't always necessarily listen. Uh, do a practice run through uh, um, ahead of the interview uh, and record a test, record a test uh, video. So you can see yourself how you come across. Um, you, know, have, uh, you, know, you may you know, even answer some specific questions. So you're practicing the, the answers to, to those points. Um, I always find it's good to have, have your CV uh, in, uh, in front of you um, and have some you know, prompts. So if there's key things that you want to highlight throughout the interview, um, then be sure that you've got the uh, prompts um, that, sort of your, you, that reminds you and you don't think after the interview, oh, I should have, you know, I forgot to mention this or I forgot to mention that. Um, and ensure you research the interview and company thoroughly. So join the interview, um, introduce yourself, um, and set, set, set the tone. Um, body language is important, um, and ensure you, uh, you keep uh, constant, constant eye contact with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the interviewer. Try and build rapport. You know, it's always good at the start to you know, show some of your personality. We'll try and build a bit of a connection with the, with the interviewer. Uh, try and avoid any neg negative topics. And fo uh, uh, or focusing on uh, yeah, trying to avoid any negative co uh, topics, uh, and obviously uh, focusing on the current situation. Um, with with your questions, be concise uh, in in your ans in your answers. Uh, I always you know, my 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 recommendation is to be give a clear, concise answer, um, and stick to the question. Yeah, if, if the if the employer or interviewer wants more information. They will ask for it, um, but what they do, what you don't want to have is a situation where they come you know, come out afterwards and think right. I asked one question and they went off talking about something else. So give it, you know, listen to the question, even take a second or two just to let it sink in. Um, uh, and if you don't understand it, don't be afraid to um, you know to ask them to elaborate as to what exactly they are looking for. What do they need? Post the interview, follow up. You know, inquire, you know, you, um, you know, ask, ask what, what timelines uh, and what are the remaining interview processes. There's nothing more frustrating that after you've been for an interview that you don't hear back for, uh, for two or three weeks. Um, so but if you know that, look, you know, that they're interviewing people for the next two weeks and they're not going to be making a decision uh, on, in terms of who to take the through to the next process until uh, two weeks' time, but at least you, you can you can relax uh, and know that that, that is that's what that, that is their process. Um, it's important. 
excuse me, um, yeah, um, to follow up with the, um, follow up with your recruiter. Um, yeah, send them an email, share the content discussed in the interview, give them your thoughts and feedback. I'm sure they're going to be, you know, they're, you know, the recruiter will be talking with the employer post post the interview, and they'll be, and the employer will be asking for what was the candidate's feedback. Are they interested? What do they think? What, what questions do they have? Um, so stay in touch with your recruiter and you know, uh, and ask ask them for for, your, for the feedback from uh, from, uh, from the interview. Lastly, uh, the last slide here is uh, in terms of um, the resources on the Michael Page um, website that I'm here to, uh, to support, support you. So, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's important that you go on there to, uh, to register your, your profile um, and so that you are on the, uh, on the Michael Page database. But there's a lot more on there, but just looking at uh, job adverts and loading your CV. There's career advice. So whether it's looking at uh, how to write a CV, how to write a cover letter, job interview tips, growing, you know, growing your career, taking it to the next steps, there, there's that, all that is on, on there. There's also a salary guide. Uh, um, there's yeah, CV fitness tips. Um, so there's, there's lots on there. So spend some time going through that. There's, there's a lot on there to help you build and, and develop uh, your, your profile. To ensure that you're, yeah, that you're in the best place to find that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thanks very much for that. That's uh, very informative. I hope you, everyone out there, found um, found that very interesting, as I'm sure you did. Lots of questions. Um, which, uh, which I'm going to go through, and I'm going to go through them as quick as possible to make sure we're able to to address as many of these questions as, as we can. So I think first of all, Dominic, um, once again, thanks for that. Uh, you must have a very, it must be a very busy time for you, especially on the candidate side, in terms of um, getting CVs in, in, in this present time. How many CVs do you get a day? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't have the exact number, but a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, you can imagine uh, there, there, there are a lot of profiles that are, that are coming through. So, so the number one, one, number one piece of advice that you'd give uh, somebody right now, so somebody's just lost their job, uh, which will, I'd imagine will be quite a, a common occurrence uh, given the current situation. Uh, what's, yeah. the, what's, the, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give them? Uh, for me, build a relationship with the recruiter. You know, that's your best bet to, uh, you know, to, uh, to get in, you know, to find out what is happening out there in the marketplace, you know, um, they'll tell you about who's recruiting, who's not recruiting, you know, uh, which companies are letting people go, which ones are growing. Um, so if you can, I would, you know, you know build, a, build a strong relationship with, with a recruiter. You know? And that's why, you know, I know it's, obviously it's difficult if you've just lost a job, but uh, you know, if you can, even if you're not looking by now, you, know, you want someone out there you know, that you can build and develop a relationship with, that will constantly tell you what's happening, what's going on. Yeah, because that, that, that is our job. That's, that's what we do from a day-to-day -day perspective. Okay. A uh, question came in. Um, what is the market situation uh, currently in Saudi Arabia? Uh, um, so we market over in KSA, um, are, this is twofold. The, if I look at the public sector and specifically um, anything related to the 2030 vision, is still is still quite it's still positive and they're still recruiting, still hiring. Um, you know the the, the 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 vision is still there. And there still needs to be delivered. So there's still a lot of recruitment happening, and that is both looking at uh, Saudi nationals and expats around the world. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in the during the presentation, um, our you know, our clients that are related to the 2030 vision are you know, hiring candidates. Uh, you know, utilising the uh, you know, Zoom, Teams, etc., and onboarding candidates remotely within their own country. So whether in the US, UK, Hong Kong, etc., they're, 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 they're doing that. Um, private sector is, is, more, is more challenging at the moment. That's, when we, that's where we've seen uh, a big, a big drop-off in, in jobs. Um, yeah, there are still pockets uh, of recruitment happening, but the private sector is a lot more challenging right now in KSA. 
Is that unique in the region or is, is that KSA uh, feature? No, no, the private sector, obviously around the region, has been heavily, you know, obviously it's been heavily hit. So yeah, you, you'll find that, um, yeah, as we've seen around the world, you know, where, you know, the government sectors are propping up, uh, you know, trying to prop up a lot of the economies um, and where the, and the private sector is obviously um, looking at where they can, uh, yeah, they can make, they can make, they can make, they can make savings. Um, so, you know, and looking at kind of costs, et cetera. So yeah, that's where, that's why, uh, yeah, the, the private sector has been yeah, hit quite heavily across the region. Okay, and um, another question, seeing the current job market, is it wise to accept any role just to survive? Uh, and how will this impact your future job search if you do? But each situation is different. Um, so again, it, it, it depends upon your, your personal circumstances. You know, um, you do, when accepting a position, you do need to consider your, your career. Um, so, you know, if you can hold out for, for the right opportunity to ensure your career goes in the right direction, I'd recommend doing so. You know? um, but again, as I said, it's, you know, it depends on your personal circumstances. And I'm sure that there's times where you know, uh, there's probably people that are in quite difficult situations right now. Uh, and so taking that employment, you know, taking any employment will probably be you know, a solution to, uh, to current situations. Okay. So, so it really depends on how, how urgently you need to earn an income rather than uh, the, the, yeah. the, the long-term effect on your, on your career, right? Exactly. So look, if you're not in that urgent position, um, then you know, it's, you know, I, I would recommend holding out for, for, for the right role. Uh, because you know, I, see, I see that you know, with, with, with uh, let's say, for example, that right job comes up in two months' time. What I, what I see with, with employers is like, well, why is that person looking to jump after two months? Why is he looking to, to jump after three months, after six months? You know, what I typically see in this part of the world is that uh, people like to see stability on a, on, on a, on a CV. Mm. So, you know, so uh, if you can, uh, and it, you know, your situation allows, then hold out for, for the right opportunity. What about age? How does, how does age impact um, your ability to, 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 re, to, to get rehired? Uh, and how do your qualifications or professional certifications impact your your attractiveness in the market? Yeah, um, you know, certainly in this part of the world, you know, when it comes to, to age, it's you know they they you know, it's, it's appreciated because you know, you've got the experience, you've got the wisdom, you've got the knowledge. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we've seen our clients create advisor roles. You know, for uh, for candidates that have got you know uh, extensive uh, ex ex experience, um, you know, I I you know, I don't under yeah you know, I can't underestimate the importance of you know, professional you know qualifications, um, degrees, uh, MBAs, but also you know looking at uh, professional you know, uh, you know certificates. You know, clients do do appreciate that. And it sets you sets you out from uh, from other other candidates. So you know, if you've got the time, you've got the opportunity uh, to be studying at the moment, to be adding you know more more feathers to your bow, do it. You know, so, yeah, you've got to look at how you how you stand yourself out from the crowd because there's a big crowd out there at the moment. So what what sets you apart? Well, there certainly is a big crowd, and uh, feathers, feathers in your bow and grey hairs are good in this region, from what Dominic is saying, so I hope we take that all into account. Um, calling the recruiter or hiring managers, uh, some organisations treat this as canvassing. What's your view? Um, okay, look, calling the, um, calling the recruiter, yeah, of course they're going to be getting a lot of calls, but... Yeah, you, you've got to somehow build a relationship with them, and you've got to look at. Uh, so yeah, how do you get how do you get yourself in front of them? Um, how do you stand yourself out again compared to the uh, to the uh, to to other other candidates? Um, so you know, what you know, what I would say you, what you don't want to be doing is, is calling uh, you know uh, your clients or candidates or sorry or, or recruiters when you're when you're not 100 percent 
suitable for, for, the, for the job. Yeah. But if you are, and you can just get in and say, look, you know, I match it because I've got, I've got, I tick every single one of the boxes because this is what I've done. Then great, that could be the that could be the call that stands yourself out uh, from uh, from 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 the other candidates. But I get it, yeah. It's you know, it is it can seem like canvassing and it can be a BD call, uh, and it's how how you do that without coming across as uh, too too salesy. And you mentioned LinkedIn. Uh, you, you mentioned LinkedIn as as uh, as a positive, uh, somewhere to maintain your your, your professional profile. And uh, somebody's asked whether um, it's worth taking the premium upgrade on LinkedIn, in your opinion, uh, and and what happens if the premium service on LinkedIn is not taken? Do you have a view on that? Um, I don't know so much from uh, from a candidate perspective. You know, certainly from a recruiter perspective, yeah, if you've got LinkedIn recruiter, it makes it a lot easier in terms of sourcing and find, finding profiles. Uh, look, from, from a candidate perspective, um, you know, it's what, I, I'm, I, I'm not too, I'm, I wouldn't, I, I don't have a point, a specific point that I'd stand on to say whether to get premium or not. But what I would say is just making sure that, again, that's how, that's how, you know, that's, that is your, you know, your marketing tool. That is your, uh, that is your uh, ability to get, get, get yourself out there. That's your CV in effect. So you've mm -hmm. got to make sure that, you know, it is up to, up, up to scratch. You know, that, and that's what I do recommend taking the time to ensure that you've got, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the photo, the information, all hundred percent, you know, updated, uh, because, you know, this day and age, uh, you know, I've been in this game now for 14 years. And so, um, you know, when I started, you know, it was, you know, we, there was no LinkedIn and so it was all very much about your own pers personal network. So I'd go and pick up a job and I know the people, you know, up here and I could be talking about this candidate and that candidate because that's through, uh, you know, uh, through the network that, that I've developed. But now, you know, I'm seeing that more and more, you know, people are going to, to LinkedIn. Even, you know, even guys in my own team, it's, uh, you know, I see that they go, their first point of call is to, to LinkedIn to try and uh, source and find profiles. And it infuriates me. I'm like, well, what about your network? You know, go to your network first. You know, LinkedIn should be you know, further down the line. Um, but it is getting more and more. It, it, you can see how important it is. So if I, I don't, I come back to your original question about premium. I don't have a, I don't have a point of view on that uh, in particular, whether that makes a big difference between having premium and not having premium. Okay. Um, how do you manage uh, discriminatory questions during the interview related to age and or nationality? Um, we always based our, our recruitment uh, upon uh, the key selection criteria that the, uh, that the client is looking for. So we never base it, you know, we don't we never discriminate uh, based on, uh, you know, on age, on nationality, on gender, Etc. Um, yeah, we base it on on the, on the key selection criteria uh, that the client's looking for. So, look, yes, you know, especially you know, there, there may be a nationalisation program, so they are looking for specific nationality. There may be specific language skill sets they're looking for. So again, yeah, there's specific nationality. But um, as yeah, as as a recruiter, we always base it on the key selection criteria that the client's looking for. Okay, so so what you're saying is, uh, and there are obviously different practices uh, around the world, I'm sure, and I'm sure it's it's very very different. But what you're saying is, if you do get in front of that recruiter, then really um, you, you shouldn't be subject to, to to kind of the scenarios that the the person who's asking has asked, uh, because yes. uh, recruit companies are upfront in this region. If the job is for a national, then it's it's very clear um, before you get interviewed, right? Correct, and you, you you'll see that many you know on the actual adverts quite often it will state that uh, obviously the specific national that you know whether it's it's a Saudi national position or any other national position you will see that generally in, in the advert. Okay, um, another question. Uh, so quite a valid question. So what we're saying is. For any vacancy, you'll, re you'll receive a lot of competent profiles, uh, clearly. Uh, you'll get a deluge of, 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 of applications or CVs. What's the process you go through? How do you shortlist a profile with so many similar 
and competent uh, credentials? Uh, what what are, the, are there one or two main factors? How does that, um, is there an algorithm? How does that actually work? Yeah. Um, so yeah, look, of course, you know, we get uh, a lot of, a lot of applications. Uh, and certainly, so I remember sort of, you know, sitting there, literally going through each application one by one by one. In this part of the world, because um, you get applications from everywhere. Uh, I remember when I was recruiting back in the UK, I posted a job, I probably get about 10, 10 applicants. So it's quite easy to, uh, to go through. Whereas in this here, it's, you know, I, I think you know, I've posted jobs and got thousands of, of, of applications. So the key thing, you know, the key thing this comes down to is again, having that relationship with, with, the, uh, with the recruiter. So when the job comes on, you know, uh, that they think that they think of you and they contact you for that job because they know that you're right for, 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 for the opportunity. You know, so, and I, you know, talking, going back to the points that I talked about earlier, so I keep, you know, like even if people aren't looking for jobs, so I keep regular contact and I'll, I'll run the job past them, you know. Um, so if you can, you know, build that, develop with, uh, with, with, the, with the recruiter. Yeah, look, in terms of the modern day skill, you know, modern day, sorry, systems and databases, there are algorithms, you know, artificial intelligence that sort of, you know, looks at all the applications and sort of brings up most relevant. So it looks at, you know, whether it looks at, you know, the years of experience, looking at, um, you know, uh, specific experience that they've got, et cetera, specific skill sets that bring up the most relevant applications. So it looks at all the applications that come through and at the top will be the most relevant that match the uh, uh, match the, um, the the advert uh, or the job description. Sorry, but you know, for me, I'm a bit more uh, old school, um, and I certainly believe in the you know that that network, and that's how you get yourself to the forefront uh, of that of that recruiter. Thank you. Which industry sector or type of company um, do you see provides the best job security in the Middle East? Which is an interesting question, uh, given the current circumstance. So, uh, brilliant question there. Um, yeah. What, what would you say? Government. Okay. Right <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Right now, it's got to be uh, certainly uh, for me. What I'm seeing is it's, it's, the, it's the government government sector. Um, and uh, yeah, if I certainly look at sort of what I spoke about earlier in uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, look, it is, um, if I look at the other, other, other sectors out there and sort of look at the sectors that I talked about earlier, you know, there are still some quite in demand, you know, uh, sectors. So whether I look at sort of FMCG, you know, food manufacturing, that's still uh, quite big. The other one I would say is certainly looking at, you know, technology, technology, digital data. Yeah, this is one, it's not just one right now, it's one over the last, last couple of years. You know, we can see where the world is going, you know, look at, you know, look at us now, we're all, we're all, you know, we're on our laptops, we're on our desktops, you know, we're communicating via, you know, uh, these you know, new platforms that uh, 10 years ago, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't utilize. So, uh, you know, I would say if you're looking at the future uh, and how to best proof yourself, I think that's going to be, you know, sort of one of the, you know, the strongest uh, sectors uh, to to be involved into. And are the government, uh, I say the government, governments, uh, are they still recruiting? Yeah, yeah. So as I said, the in Saudi pub set still, you know, still recruiting. Now, look, as I said, it's it's more so it's the projects related to the twenty thirty vision. Um, that, that I see still, you know, still very much, you know, uh, push, pushing ahead rather than, than looking at specific, you know, for example, ministries. So I suppose it's more semi, you know, semi, semi, you know, semi, semi government. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, they, they're still, still recruiting. In the um, looking at procurement um, in that area, uh, in the technology space, uh, as far as procurement is concerned. In the technology space, do you consider indirect experience as a, as stronger than direct slash reseller experience? 
Yeah, no, I've seen, uh, and this is something I've seen over the last over the last ten years. I've always seen there's been a big uh, big demand out here for for indirect because uh, it forms such a large you know, cost base for a lot of the you know, a lot of the clients that we've uh, that we've we've been we've been we've been working with. Maybe it's the case that I've not done enough work in, uh, with direct direct clients that I've not seen, in, you know, or clients that have more of a need for direct candidates. Um, you know, I've certainly, if I look from the manufacturing point of view, you know, I've seen out here there's been more of a demand for for indirects, whereas you know, for the global direct guys and global commodities, I've seen based elsewhere around the world rather than based uh, based based out here. Okay. Interesting. And I mean, there's a few views on because you mentioned LinkedIn, and, and you did also say, um, you know, when you started in this game, LinkedIn was not was not was not a factor. Um, uh, and I recall that because, of course, uh, Dob, I know you very well. But um, a, a question coming up here is, uh, in that case, what's the future of recruitment itself? Surely there has to be, um, <laughs> you know, um, th th there has to be uh, a new model. Uh, you know, CVs are, are a lot more fluid, uh, and also there's uh, so many applications for each role. Um, mm. Some of the best candidates don't even get seen. Is is there a new approach, a new model to to recruitment that's out there? No, 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 I, I'm seeing some of these. There's one. Uh, there was a provider um, in the UK that's recently reached out to us, and it's this new video interviewing uh, uh, services they're providing. So basically, you know, all the candidates will be sent the uh, sent the uh, sent the questions. They'll answer those those questions, and you can literally then just click on the uh, you know, specific questions. You know, so you go to certain parts of the uh, uh, certain parts of the uh, the, the, the interviews, etc. Um, so the, the the market is yeah, it does ever ever evolve. But you know, if you ask me, who are the people that, for example, if I look at my personal business, who are the people that are doing the best are the people that have the strongest net in their, in their space. So it's the people that have been out here the longest, that have taken the time to, to build and develop that network. They're the ones that are still doing, uh, still, you know, making the most placements. It's not the person that sits on, on LinkedIn just you know, sending out the most invitations, you know, um, because clients, also when you sit in front of a client, they value that knowledge that, that you have. They want to know that you are a sector expert, that they're not just going, because otherwise what's the difference between them going and then just going to their internal TA team and asking them to do, to do the recruitment? There's, there's, no, there's no difference. Okay. So, so is there still a place? Is there still a, 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 a massive relevance for people in your field? Is what you're saying? Or recruitment companies as subject matter experts? I hope so. <laughs> okay. There you go. Remains to be seen. Yeah. yeah it, there's obviously a lot of times where you know recruitment is done on a on a, on a, on a confidential uh, basis. Yeah. But yeah, one of the the big things, especially you know, page that. We, you know, we specialize in a specific vertical. You don't recruit across the board. So you're not one day recruiting procurement, the next day recruiting finance, the day after that you're recruiting an HR person. No, you, you know, we, we allocate someone to a specific uh, sector, uh, sorry, specific discipline, and that's all they recruit into. So you become a subject matter expert. Okay. Um, so one, one person who's asking the question has said that uh, they've experienced a lot of discrimination uh, on the basis of age and nationality when applying for jobs. Um, how could you, what advice could you give them on how to handle this going forward? Uh, because in, the, in their view, they, they've got extensive experience and, and you, you know, can, can add value to any organization. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a difficult question to, to, to answer, but what you want to know is to find out why you know, if you can get the information as to why you've not been considered for the for the position, because there may be, you know, there may be, a, you know, maybe that actually, unfortunately, I've got you know these other applications that are ticking every single one of the boxes, and your your application, unfortunately, you lack the specific uh, skill set. Mm. Yeah. So, 
what's important is, as I said, if you can get the information as to find out as to why you're not being considered for the opportunity. But I think in this region, uh, uh, Dom, in terms of the feedback and, and certainly the 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 inference here is that it, it's it's the feedback that's lacking. So people are not getting feedback um, for so, so they they may have applied and not got feedback or they may have uh, been interviewed and not got feedback and therefore uh, they're not having that dialogue. Are there any other routes to, to getting that feedback or, or how can they determine, how can they break that loop? Now that's where ideally you've got a recruiter. You know, the, the recruiter then obviously, you know, the, you, know, you, you know the client's more likely, he's gonna tell the candidate, tell the recruiter what's going on in that process. You know, if you go directly, that's where you're gonna face, face that challenge. Um, and uh, unfortunately, within the recruitment game, you know, yes, there's, uh, yeah, for lack of a better word, probably a lot of cowboys, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and yeah, they just both, you know, all just focus on you know closing the deal rather than actually actually giving that feedback back to the candidates to you know to ensure that actually right, okay, why didn't I get the opportunity, uh, and what do I build on in the future? Because I've always made sure, for me personally. I would make sure that I give the feedback and give the direct feedback. You know, don't don't sugarcoat it. You know, because that's the you know, that's the only way to learn from from your mistakes. You know, so as much as sometimes it's it's hard to do that, you know, give give the candidate direct feedback. You know, uh, so they can learn from it in, in the future. Okay, and in, in uh, sticking with the field of procurement and supply chain, uh, in your experience, in, in what you've seen, what what is preferred? Is it generalists? Or specialists within uh, within procurement, I would say specialists. Okay. Yeah, so, certainly. Yeah. So kind of ca category specialists, category managers, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That's well, that's where I've constantly seen the big, big, the, yeah, the big demand. Until you get further up, you know, once you you see the um, the procurement directors. Uh, then you'll find obviously that they're managed you know across the indirect space shall we say um, sure. so yeah so i would say yeah specialist and moving into the region um obviously there's a lot of job adverts or certainly there used to be i don't know what it's like now but um moving into the region coming into uh, when i say the region you know for those uh, dialing in globally i'm speaking coming into the middle east region uh, how many years minimum procurement experience do companies typically look for uh, in candidates looking to move over to, to the Middle East? Sorry, so just so if I understand, so candidates have come over to the region? No, no in terms of, uh, so employer, employer, employers looking to employ people to come into the region yeah. from other parts of the world. Uh, how many minimum years of procurement experience are those companies typically looking for from the candidate? Yeah, I would say you know, the typical, the minimum level would be a category manager level. So we're saying what seven, eight years uh, experience. Okay. But again, then when you're coming in internationally, they want that specialist you know, skill set. They want that specialist knowledge. So, so they want a category manager with, with several years experience in in in, yeah, in, yeah. in a particular field okay uh and uh i think uh you know as we're wrapping up um sort of finally what what kind of indication are your clients giving you as to when we expect a level of a normality um to come back into the economy and in the job market um we so, no, I wish I knew that answer. Um, yeah, um, but unfortunately, yeah, we 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 we're not sure at the moment. It, look, we're seeing some really positive signs uh, around the world that we're seeing markets starting to uh, to to gradually open up. Let's hope that that sort of then yeah filters uh, here in the coming yeah weeks and weeks and months. Uh, yeah, um, you yeah, know, we're heading into quarter three. Quarter three has always been a notoriously difficult quarter uh, in this part of the world, because obviously um, during the summertime, people, you know, uh, you know we found that take you know, extensive breaks, uh, extensive, extensive vacations. So uh, Q3 has always, a bit of, it's always been a challenging one. So 
we you know we're not sure about sort of how that looks and we're hoping then to have then sort of from September onwards you know going into Q4 and that's when we'll see you know the, the rebound. Um, but yeah we're we're you know we're still we're still not yeah you know, we're still not hundred percent sure like as I said we've got candidates that are have been made offers that have accepted offers and resigned from their jobs. Our clients are just starting them remotely, starting them in their home country whilst we wait to see when we'll be able to get them get them over here uh, you know, uh, permanently. Okay. And we, we focused on, uh, actually, we asked some specific questions around um, KSA, Saudi Arabia, earlier on. Um, what about uh, Bahrain and Qatar? Um, what, what's, the, what's the situation there? And again, the question relates to procurement and supply chain management industry in terms of job opportunities. Uh, and actually, the question is saying, uh, what are the opportunities there compared to the UAE? And what is the possibility of hiring professionals uh, from other continents? So yeah. Bahrain and Qatar and, and 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 all the things mixed around that. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't I don't do enough in those in those. I, well, I don't do anything in those markets. You know, uh, the knowledge I have is you know, it's KSA and obviously Germany and then uh, and then the UAE. Uh, you know, we still. That being said, you know, we still see opportunities uh, over in uh, over in Qatar, Bahrain. Bahrain uh, certainly still seems to be from a financial services. Uh, point of view, um, fairly, you know, fairly, fairly strong. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we all know that sort of that, you know, Bahrain used to be the FS capital here in here in the region, and I think there's going to be a you know, push to you know, within that space you know, again. So I certainly see the FS sector being being strong in uh, in Bahrain. In Qatar, I, you know, I don't deal with don't deal with it at all. Um, so I, I don't, I won't be able to give an answer on that in terms of, you know, in terms of how we see the market over there. Okay, and um, I'm not sure how prevalent this is, but uh, somebody saying that they received a job offer from uh, a major company based in Abu Dhabi. Uh, mm -hmm. They accepted it. Um, the COVID-19 happened. The recruiter literally disappeared. Uh, hope that wasn't you, Dom, because they they caught up with you again. If that's the case, but uh, <laughs> they found you. Uh, the recruiter literally disappeared, and they uh, and they haven't heard anything else. They've sent follow up emails, but nothing received yet. Uh, I know. What would you recommend in this situation? Um, this happened uh, a month, uh, or, or a month has elapsed since this happened. Sam, apologies, my my system froze. My uh, I, I, I thought I, I thought you were trying to disappear again, <laughs> as, as recruiters appear to do. <laughs> Hello. Uh, okay, uh, Dom, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Right, okay. Right. Okay. It's a, a, a tactical disappearance. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So, 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 so this this uh, this individual received a job offer from uh, yep. a rep reputable large organisation. Accepted it. COVID happened. The recruiter literally disappeared. Uh, in inverted commas, um, this happened a month ago. Uh, they sent follow up emails, but haven't received anything. What would they? What would you recommend in those situations? Yeah. So we have obviously two things. Once we've seen you know, we've seen agencies that obviously. Some have closed down their, their local offices. People have, you know, some have let people go. You know. um, so my recommendation, you know, if that company is still in existence, then it's reaching out to uh, to that person's to that recruiter's line manager, uh, you know, or uh, um, you know, or whoever runs the organisation, you know, trying to find that trying to find that person, or you know, like reach out to the company directly. So if you've got an offer from an organisation, yeah. Uh, then reach out to the company directly. That's what I would do. You know, explain to them, say, look, I've been trying to get hold of the uh, uh, recruiter, but I've not heard from them for, for a number of weeks. Yeah. Uh, Making the case that, look, unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, they've had to withdraw the offer. You know, at least they can give you that that answer. Okay. So, so the, the question is, see if you can. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the answer is going to be here that they don't have uh, direct contacts in the organization. But what you're saying is if you can uh, bypass the recruiter and try to get directly to the organization just to get the answer, yeah? If, you, if, the, if, the, if the recruitment company is still there, 
then you know, speak to that recruiter's line manager. You know, go go further up the chain. You know, to find out what's, what's going on. Yeah, you know, try and speak to someone. Because as I said, there are, there are I have heard of instances with some some companies have closed down their local offices. There might be a case of the agency is in existence anymore. So if that's the case, then yeah, reach out to the organisation. But if that agency is in existence, then speak to that person's line manager. If you still can't get hold of one, and it's been a few weeks since you've actually got hold of that uh, recruiter, then yeah, if it's been three, four weeks and you've got an offer and nothing's happened, then I would, and you, if you've got the, you know, obviously you've clearly met someone at that organisation, then ideally yeah, you try and reach out to them directly to find out what's going on. Okay. Great, thanks for that, and I, I help, hope that uh, that answers the question uh, that was asked regarding the the recruiter who went AWOL, absent without leave. Um, we had a question from Aisha, Aisha Ab, uh, Abdul uh, Salamad. Aisha, would you like, like to ask the question live? Yes, please. Go ahead. Hi, Tom. Hi, Aisha, um, how are you? My question, I'm doing well, and I hope you and your family is doing well too. Um, so I have a very specific question for you, um, and it's regarding the educational background. So if you have an undergraduate um, degree in one program, let's say finance, and then you have a graduate degree in another program, let's say environmental sciences and sustainability, but then this sort of are not similar things, and then you have experience in something else. So then how do you land a good job? What I have observed is in this part of the world, if you have sort of a versatile role and you're not a specialist, then it's hard to get a job. However, if you're in Europe or in North America, it's way easier to get a job, even if you have different backgrounds and different sort of experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, what I found, what I find here is that it's very much looking at the experience that you've got and that specialist experience, and that's where you're more than likely uh, going to get going to get the, the job. You know, um, especially when it comes to you know, working with with recruiters. You know, recruiters are exceptionally good at putting square pegs into into square holes because you know, a client comes to us and they're looking for a specific skill set, and that's and that's and that's what they want, and that's what they want to provide them with. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. Certainly, back when you, if you look at the US, you look at the North American market, and you look at the European market. That's when people are probably a bit more are more flexible and more open to you know looking at people's you know uh, background and uh, the ability to adapt into you know into different uh, positions within an organisation. So they'll more look at the person and what they can do with that with that individual. Answer the question, Aisha. But then how do you land a job with that sort of uh, resume in, in the Middle East? If you're, yeah. if you're not a specialist, then how do you land a good job in this part of the world? Um, the, the challenge you'll find with, with, you know, with, as I said, with recruiters will be that we're, you know, we're great square pegs, square holes. You know, if, you know, you know, if you're not a specialist and you are a generalist, um, then you know, it's then how do you build and develop your network that you can find you know, you know, people and employers that are more open to generalist generalist people uh, with with generalist generous backgrounds. So um, now and then the current time is probably quite is quite difficult, but it's how you you attend you know, networking you know, network events. Now we want to right now looking at sort of the online networking forums. Um, so you build and develop that network. That people start, you know, you start to connect with uh, people that are the hiring managers and are open to see the potential within a specific individual, rather than looking at uh, for a specific uh, skill set. But Asia, the, the challenge you'll find working with you know, the recruiters said, recruitment it, recruiters are great at putting the square pegs into the square holes. You know, that, that's why the client, that's why the client has uh, has come to us because they want a specific specific skill set. Uh, especially skill skill set and knowledge. There you go. Th thanks for that, Dom. And I think we'll, we'll go to the last question today, which was, uh, and thanks for that question uh, as well, Aisha. Thanks very much. Um, the question was, so if you see a, um, uh, if you see a recruit, if you see a job advert on a company's job page, um, is it better to forward your CV through that company's job page or 
um, to go through a um, to go through a specialist recruiter. I would say go through you know, go through a recruiter. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a, <laughs> I'm a recruiter. Um, I've seen it all too often that um, you know um, that someone applied directly and it just goes off into a black hole and that's it. You'll never hear you never hear anything back from them. Whereas if you can do it through a recruiter and someone that you've got a relationship with, that then they you know, obviously you can get specific feedback. You know, um, yeah, I've even seen the instance where you know candidates have applied directly, nothing. Uh, they then apply through for an agency, and they and that's when they get the get the interview, because you know when you're applying directly to to an opportunity, um, that's when uh, you know, you're you're up. You know, for example, what I was talking about earlier, where there might be a thousand applicants, so you might be you know, lost um, yeah, amongst all the all the other candidates. Whereas you know when you're going through a recruiter, the recruiter should only really be presenting four five CVs for for for, for a job. Yeah, within their, within that shortlist, so um, yeah, you've got a much better uh, chance when you're going through for a recruiter. So that's not a entirely, um, uh, you know, it's not it's not the answer I did not expect. Let's put it that way. So uh, thanks for that, Don, for not disappointing. Uh, but most importantly, uh, th thanks for taking the time. We really do appreciate you spending your time. Um, joining us today um taking the time out of your busy schedule as as we know it is now uh, just a final note if someone wants to contact you how do they do that sure um, um so uh if you want to reach out to me um feel free to reach out to me on uh, on linkedin or go to the michael page website all my details are there my details are also on, on linkedin feel free to to drop me drop me an email drop me an email um, and uh, and I'll, I'll yeah I'll be sure to get it, get get back in touch with 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 you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who participated today. Uh, thanks once again to Dominic. Thanks for the questions. Hope it was useful. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.